Welcome to Flight Radio Telephone Operator Exam Prep Part 1. Part 1 because it's a three part series, broken into pieces so that we can go through it and digest it in an easier way. At the end of the uh, slides you'll see uh, about 20 to 30 Q&As. Run through the questions. If you get 100% you're going to get pretty much 70 to 80% on the exam. So kick back, enjoy, see how you go. Basic wave propagation. Very high frequency VHF communication is the primary source of communication within general aviation. There's a large number of frequencies within the VHF bandwidth, which means a large number of services are attributed to it. Reception is better than lower frequencies, so there are minimum static interference, unlike high frequency. In New Zealand, the VHF frequencies used range from 118.0 to 135.95 MHz. Range is 10%. Signals go straight through the ionosphere, giving no returns, unlike high frequency. Please remember that for very high frequency, range is line of sight plus 10%. The main disadvantage of VFF, VHF communication is that signals do not bend and can only follow a straight line. For example, line of sight plus 10% for VHF communications. VHF transmissions are direct wave and the receiver must be in line of sight, meaning range is limited by the curvature of the earth, as you can see in the illustration below. To avoid interruption of reception, two remedies are available to you. Fly higher, and maintain line of sight with the transmission station or tuning into a closer station. The high frequency communication band has a range of frequencies between 3 and 30 megahertz which are used for long distance communications or communicating in remote areas where VHF reception would be poor. The reason high frequency communications are used in these situations is that the transmissions are reflected back to the earth by the ionosphere. These reflected high frequency radio waves are called sky waves and are able to be picked up from much further than direct waves as they bounce or make multiple hops between the Earth and the ionosphere. HF transmissions also create ground waves which stick closely to the surface of the Earth and can travel in parallel with the Earth for great distances. The sky waves are able to come down on the lee side of hills and mountain ranges making high frequency communication possible without line of sight, unlike VHF signals. Unfortunately, when the signals are reflected back to Earth, static interference and signal fade, caused by the sky wave and surface wave being out of phase, both cause high frequency signals to have reduced clarity. Both the high frequency surface waves and sky waves have differing ranges. Surface waves up to 200 nautical miles from the transmitter, sky waves up to 2000 nautical miles from the transmitter, as you can see from the illustration below. Now let's move on to the aircraft radio itself. First of all, the transceiver. Aircraft are usually equipped with at least one radio which operates on the VHF range. An aircraft's radio will be a transmitter and receiver. This enables the pilot to talk as well as listen to other aircraft or ground radio operators. This type of radio is called a transceiver. There are many different makes and models of aircraft radio, indicative picture of a communication or comm radio. It is possible and normal for the aircraft comm radio to also have navigation or nav functions included within that one radio set. This saves space in the aircraft instrument panel and there, as there is no need for a comm radio transmitting and receiving VHF signals and then installing a second radio just to receive the VHF nav. When communication and navigation functions are combined, this set is called a navcom set. Navigation aids such as VOR, NDB and DME all transmit VHF signals that pilots can use to determine their aircraft's track and distance whilst flying without visual reference to the ground. 
Further reference to navigational aids is beyond the scope of the PPL flight radio syllabus. Other radio equipment, a microphone used to transmit messages, a speaker to receive messages, headphones with an inbuilt microphone can transmit and receive messages, an aerial to pick up the radio waves, a master switch or in larger aircraft an avionics power switch, an audio selector panel so that pilots can switch between transmitting and receiving on different radios in aircraft with more than one radio. Operation of aircraft radios. Switching on. Light aircraft radios are usually able to switch on using the master switch. In larger aircraft, an avionics power switch may also have to be switched on before the radio will receive power. As radios require a lot of power to transmit and receive signals, they drain an aircraft's battery at a high rate. If they are used when the engine is not running, this will add power drain significantly to the battery. And if they are left switched on whilst on the ground without the engine running, they can cause dead batteries in a relatively short amount of time. It is also recommended to leave the aircraft radio off during the start as fluctuating voltages during the engine start can damage the sensitivity of the radio equipment. Some airports require the pilots to receive a start clearance, pilot having to turn on the radio to make that request. Once start clearance is received, the pilot will usually switch off the radio and start the engine before switching them back on. This prevents any potential damage to the radio circuitry during start. Like most electrical equipment on board an aircraft, circuit breakers and fuses can be found which will pop or blow to isolate the radio equipment from other aircraft electrical systems if a problem arises. Circuit breakers and fuses should only be reset once. The audio panel. The image below shows an aircraft radio with the audio panel above it. On the left side of the dividing line, the pilot is able to select if the received radio transmissions are heard on the aircraft speaker or through the headphones via push buttons. The pilot is also able to choose which communication he or she wants to listen to. COM1, COM2, NAV1. It must be noted that it, this setup listens to more than one frequency. On the right hand side of the dividing line is a toggle switch which can be turned so that the pilot can transmit on COM1, COM2, internal, etc. The pilot can only transmit on one frequency at a time, but it is possible to listen to one frequency and transmit onto a, an alternate frequency. So careful selection and an awareness of how your radio is set up is essential. Let's move on to the squelch control. The squelch control is fitted in aircraft radios to filter any unwanted white noise or static so that the pilot can hear transmissions more clearly. As the squelch is turned up, clockwise direction, the filter becomes less effective and the pilot will hear more and more of the unwanted static. With the squelch turned down, the pilot will be able to reduce the white noise until it's at an acceptable level. The reason that squelch is not turned the whole way down is that squelch control affects the signal which the radio is receiving and will also mission which one to receive, i.e. the words transmitted which could lead us to believing that the radio has failed. As the aircraft gets further away from the transmitting station, the pilot needs to turn up the squelch to retain the signal to the same station. Most radio problems arise from the user not operating the radio correctly, or having some other issue with the radio equipment. The following applies to a radio not operating on the ground and lists some of the checks that can be carried out to identify the problem. First, check the master switch and avionics switch if fitted are on. Check the radio on off switch is on. If a navcom radio is fitted make sure the comm side is on. Check the audio panel has the correct radio selected. Check the circuit breakers and fuses. Check the microphone and headphone boom is correctly plugged in. Check the correct frequency has been selected. 
check the volume is not too low, check the squelch is not in the fully anti-clockwise position, if white noise is the squelch down. If your radio is still not operating, it is advised that you do not fly your aircraft until the cause of the fault has been identified. A headset boom microphone combination is a pilot's most common way of receiving and making transmissions. The reason for this is that the pilot is able to use the radio by pushing and holding down the PTT or push to talk button without taking his or her hands off the control column. Also, when talking to passengers or a student in light aircraft, the headset provides an intercom system when the PTT is not held down. A handheld microphone is commonly used as a backup in case of a headset or boom micros, uh, microphone failure. These can be quite tricky to use as the microphone needs to be picked up and held near the pilot's mouth to make transmissions while holding the PTT button on the side of the microphone. The handheld microphone is not placed back into its holder after use and only placed in the pilot's lap. There is a chance that the PTT button will be depressed and the microphone will make a long continuous transmission, blocking all others on the radio frequency that you're using to make transmissions. With all microphones, it is not possible to send a message called intelligence directly as radio waves. The aircraft's transceiver must generate a carrier wave for your message. This is achieved when the pilot presses the PTT, but does not speak into the radio. By speaking into the microphone, the pilot's words, the intelligence, are put on the radio waves through a process called modulation. Now, both of these have been seen in exam questions before, so please understand the difference between intelligence and modulation. Intelligence is the message. Modulation is the process by which we put the intelligence it's 17 hours. on the radio waves. There's two types of modulation. AM, varying the amplitude of the carrier wave. Frequency modulation, FM, varying the frequency of the carrier radio wave, clearer than amplitude modulation. Key points for using an aircraft microphone are 1. The PTT, push to talk or microphone button, must be held down whilst talking. 2. Your transceiver cannot receive whilst you are transmitting. And 3. When you are transmitting, all other transmissions on that frequency are blocked. The microphone must be directly in front of and close to the pilot's mouth. This helps transmit a clear signal with a minimum amount of background noise. The pilot should speak slightly slower than usual and at a normal conversational volume. Before making any transmission, a pilot should remember these key points. Listen first. If others are talking, do not interrupt as these transmissions may require a response. Wait for a gap to make your transmission. If you hear a mayday or a pain pain call, do not transmit even when there are gaps in transmission. If you are making a mayday or pain pain call, you can interrupt others to get your message out. Decide what you want to say before transmitting. Once ready to transmit your message, follow this procedure. Press transmit and hold until you have finished talking. Hold the microphone close to and in front of your mouth. Speak in a normal voice, slightly slower than usual, and pronounce words clearly. When pronouncing numbers, insert a brief pause before and after each number. When your message has, been, has to be written down, speak slower to the recipient so that they have time to write it. Now the key points in this slide is, before transmitting, listen first. And secondly, decide what you want to say before transmitting. Both of these are very common questions in the exam. Civil Aviation Rules Civil Aviation Rule 91-217, Pre-Flight Action Before commencing a flight, a pilot in command of an aircraft must obtain and become familiar with all information concerning that flight 
including the status of the communication and navigation facilities intended to be used. This means the pilot has to read NOTEMS and AIP supplements to find out if any of the other frequencies he or she requires will not be working or have changed temporarily. Civil Aviation Rule 91.513 VFR Communication Equipment Unless, unless authorised by ATC to operate under VFR without radio communication, an aircraft operating under VFR in controlled airspace classified as Class B, C, D or in Class E airspace acts with radio communication equipment. The radio communication equipment must meet Level 1 or Level 2 standards and be capable of providing continuous two-way communication with the appropriate ATC unit. An aircraft operating under VFR outside controlled airspace must be equipped with radio communication equipment that meets Level 1 or Level 2 standards in the equipment to be used for communication with any ATS unit. Key note here, and Level 2 standards must be complied with. Law 91.515, Communication and Navigation Equipment VFR over water. An aircraft operating under VFR over water at a distance that is more than 30 minutes flying time from the nearest shore must be equipped with the communication equipment that meets Level 1 or Level 2 standards and is capable of providing continuous two-way communication with the appropriate ATS unit or aeronautical telecommunications facility. If using navigation equipment such as ADF or VORs, this navigation equipment must be capable of being used to navigate the aircraft in accordance with the flight plan. And secondly, Law 91245, Operations in Controlled Airspace. A pilot aircraft operating in Class A airspace must operate the aircraft under IFR and unless otherwise authorised by the ATC unit responsible for the Class A airspace, maintain two-way communication with that ATC unit on the appropriate frequency. If different classes of airspace adjoin one above the other, a pilot operating at the common level may comply with the requirements of the least restrictive class of airspace. Moving on to the transponder. A transponder is an airborne radar unit which responds to either ground-based radar or airborne collision avoidance systems, ACAS, which are equipped in most larger aircraft. These send a coded pulse, called an interrogation, to the transponder which triggers a coded response telling the ground-based radar or ACAS equipment the aircraft bearing, distance and in some cases altitude information of the transponder. It is the transponder that gives the distance blip, or the distinctive blip, on an aircraft air, air traffic controller's screen, allowing aircraft identification. The transponder codes. To use the transponder, a four-figure code must be entered into the transponder's window. This code could be a permanent code for your particular aircraft, or a temporary code issued to you by an air traffic controller. Codes are also issued to different classes of aircraft, e.g. VFR aircraft, 1200, or VFR helicopters, 1500. Some of the key ones to remember here are VFR, all when operating in an aerodrome traffic circuit at a controlled aerodrome, 2200. VFR aeroplanes, 1200 and powered aircraft in designated general aviation areas 1400. There will be questions on the exam around transponder codes and there's also some exams at the end of this section. We've looked at the transponder codes now let's look at the transponder modes. The picture below shows a transponder with a four-figured code in the window and a toggle switch to the left of a small amber light and the words IDENT. This toggle switch can be moved into five distinct positions. OFF. The transponder is off and cannot be de detected by ground base or ACAS equipment. STANDBY. 
The transponder is switched on but will not reply to any interrogation. On. The transponder will reply with mode A information only, i.e. it will not send altitude information. Alt. The transponder will send both mode A and mode C information. And test. The transponder's test function. To further understand the transponder modes, the transponder operates in two basic modes. Mode A provides identification of your aircraft to the ground. A full-figured code that is put into the window provides Mode A information. Mode C, nearly all transponders can transmit Mode C, which is the automatic reporting of altitude in the coded response. Back to a bit of air law. Part 91247 requires pilots to operate their transponders in mode A or C unless otherwise instructed by ATC or the transponder is capable of being operated in mode S, which are the more advanced transponders. Unless otherwise required by ATC, only one of the aircraft in a formation flight is required to operate a transponder transmitting mode A or C information. The transponder emergency codes. The following transponder emergency codes are used in the event of an in-flight emergency, loss of radio communication, or an act of unlawful interference. These codes are nationally recognized emergency codes laid down by the International Civil Aviation Organization. 7500, unlawful interference. 7600, communications failure. And 7700, emergency or distress. There's two common ways of being able to remember these. The first is ELT, moving from 7700 to 7500, E for emergency, L for loss of communication, and T for terrorist. Another one is a common statement that's made that says, Hi Jack, I can't hear you, help. Hijack being the hijacking of an aircraft at 7500. I can't hear you being a loss of communication at 7600. And help being 7700 is an emergency and a distress. Transponder terminology. The transponder is a vital piece of equipment for air traffic control to ensure separation between aircraft. And for this reason, there are a number of instructions that a pilot may be given regarding their transponder. When ATC tells you to squawk, it means set the code in the transponder window to whatever they've suggested. Now, in normal operation, the transponder should be set to standby before you set the code and then back to alt once selected. So that if you're flicking through the dial, you don't inadvertently throw out 7700. The pilot is required to read back the code. So, ATC tells you squawk 3277. It means set the code to 3277. Before you do so, read it back, confirm it, and then set it. Reset squawk means they want you to change the squawk code on your transponder. The pilot may have selected the wrong code, and the pilot is still required to read back, reset, squawk, to, whatever. Second to last is confirm squawk. It means that you confirm the correct mode A code is set in your transponder. You would read back the code that is set on your transponder, and you may be asked to change your code or leave it. Okay. Confirm squawk 7500. Five is alive, checking means confirm you've sent, not inadvertently, to 7500. Now again, this goes back to switching it into standby, changing it, and then back to Alt once selected. To continue the transponder terminology, if you get told to squawk Charlie, it means set your tr transponder so that it will give out mode C altitude information. 
set Alt on your transponder and advise ATC. If your transponder does not have Mode C information, you need to inform ATC that you can only work without altitude information. Should you receive a request to squawk 7372 and ident, it means push the ident button after you have set the correct squawk code. This will make your aircraft symbol flash on the controller screen and no other action is required. Should you receive a request to confirm level, it means the pilot must report his or her altitude to the nearest 100 feet can use Mode C information, they must check it is accurate. ATC screen must show the aircraft's altitude within 200 feet of the altitude that the pilot has read out. If outside of this limit, ATC cannot use the transponder's Mode C function. Check altimeter setting and confirm means check that you have the correct setting of the altimeter. Well, you may not have set the correct Q&H and report your altitude to the nearest 100 feet. Stop squawk means select off on the transponder. Stop squawk Charlie wrong ident uh, indication means you have tried to correct a wrong readout of the aircraft's altitude and it's still not within tolerance. It is better not to transmit mode C than continue to give ATC incorrect information. So you just switch the transponder to on. Squawk normal means return transponder to normal operation, i.e. alt mode. Squawk standby means select the standby setting and the aircraft symbol will disappear from radar. Squawk mayday means ATC want you to select 7700. Transponder mandatory airspace. All controlled airspace in New Zealand is transponder mandatory. That is, transponder mandatory is marked on all VNC charts and indicated with a TM. While operating in transponder mandatory airspace, the aircraft you are flying must be equipped with an operable transponder. If you notice or suspect a transponder failure while in transponder mandatory airspace, you must advise ATC immediately. ATC may, at their discretion, allow you entry into transponder mandatory airspace with some conditions. Uh, fly to an airport where the transponder can be fixed. The image displayed indicates the airspace is a Class C Ohakia controlled area with a lower limit of 2,500 feet and is transponder mandatory, indicated by the TM symbol. You will note there are other areas on this chart which also have the TM symbol next to them. This is due to the fact that the lower limit, radio frequency or controlling authority has changed. Remember, all controlled airspace is transponder mandatory in New Zealand. The Emergency Locator Transmitter All aircraft in New Zealand are required by Part 91.529 to be equipped with and have a fully operable ELT bar. A few exceptions are listed below and there are several different types of ELT. The Emergency Locator Transmitter Automatic Fixed or ELT AF Emergency Locator Transmitter Survival or the ELTS the emergency position indicated radio beacon, the EPUB. Most light aircraft are fitted with an ELT AF, which is permanently installed, usually fitted towards the rear of the fuselage. If a sudden deceleration occurs above a set limit, the ELT will automatically start transmitting its location. This provides pilots with a means of being located if the aircraft crashes and they are unable to radio for help or lost and cannot give directions to their location after a crash landing. It must also be noted that if a pilot makes a heavy landing, the ELT may also be, which is why it is normal and standard for your post-landing checks that you check the ELT uh, radio beacon.
Automatic activation of the ELT provides a gain in valuable time for the National Rescue Coordination Center to find an aircraft that has gone missing to locate survivors. There are some key points to take note of with the ELT activation. If the beacon has not switched on, turn it on manually and leave it on until rescued. If leaving the site of crash or force landing, the ELT should be taken by the survivors. This is possible due to the fact that most ELTs have their own battery power source, which should give 24 to 48 hours of transmission depending on the state of battery. A fully charged battery should give you 48 hours of transmission. And it's a keynote to remember, it's a very popular exam question. Once activated, the ELT will transmit a distinctive undulating signal on the international distress frequency. For VHF, that's 121.5, and for UHF, that's 406 MHz, every 50 seconds. The signal contains identification data, which the RCCNZ can use, such as the make, model, and registration of the aircraft, the owner, and contact details. This assists RCCNZ in their efforts to locate missing aircraft. It's important to remember that the international distress frequencies are 121.5 for VHF and 406 MHz for UHF, and that's broadcast from the ELT every 50 seconds. Now there are some exceptions to carrying ELTs within flight. These exceptions are a single seat aircraft, as long as an ELTS or an EPIRB is carried, a glider or microlight aircraft that is carrying more than one person, as long as an ELTS or EPIRB is carried, a glider or powered aircraft with no more than two seats, which is not flying further than 10 nautical miles from the departure aerodrome, a manned free balloon. If the aircraft is ferried, to a place for an ELT to be installed, if the aircraft is ferried from a place where the ELT repairs cannot be made to a place where they can be. And lastly, an aircraft can be operated for a period of seven days if the ELTAF is not working, but a portable ELT is made accessible to each person on board. Now, as stated earlier, the ELT is activated automatically when a sudden deceleration above a set limit occurs. This will be shown by a red light flashing on the dash. If ELT fails to activate automatically, the pilot is able to use the ELT switch located on the dash of the cockpit to turn it on manually. Now, the image there shows a typical cockpit ELT switch. It must be noted though that the ELT switches do not have an OFF switch. The switch only has two positions, ARM and ON. If a pilot has an emergency during flight, it's recommended that the ELT is set to ON so that the RCCNZ can start receiving position location information and identify the aircraft that is having trouble. The RCCNZ will monitor the aircraft until the point of forced landing or crash and be on the way to rescue any injured personnel sooner. If the emergency situation is resolved in the air, the ELT should be moved back to arm and the flashing LED should extinguish. If this happens, the pilots must inform ATC and the RCCNZ as soon as practical once landed. Otherwise, they will assume that the aircraft has crashed and continue emergency rescue procedures. Testing of the ELT must be carried out in a shielded area and is restricted to the first five minutes after the hour, for example, between 0900 and 0905. Don a headset and tune into 121 to listen for the audio sweeps when on. This is selected on the ELT switch. Test should be no longer than three audio sweeps and the red LED light should flash with ON selected. Pilots should always check the 121.5 MHz frequency after landing and check to see if the ELT switch switches red light is 
the light is flashing and the audio is heard, the ELT switch should be selected to on for no longer than five seconds and then returned to the arm position. This should switch the ELT off, causing the flashing red light to extinguish. Once this is done, ATC and RCCNZ must be advised as emergency rescue procedures may have already begun. So now we've got to the end of part one. How much do you remember? It's going to be a series of questions shortly after here, and I need you to pause and resume the video while you're answering the questions. After the question has been identified on screen, pause, read the question carefully. Once you've understood what the question is asking, look at the answers and select the most appropriate. Once you've done that, press resume and the slide will flick over to the answer. Work through these and if you find that you have failed any, return back to the beginning of part one and just brush through it again. You should, at the end of this, be able to answer all coming questions without a problem.